Welcome to Arkham Postcast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I don't know how to feel today. Um, uh, how are you doing over there? I, well, I just, I, I woke up recently, so I am, I'm, I'm still kind of getting back into the swing of things, but uh, yeah, uh, a show from which nothing will be the same. Uh, afterwards exactly so so definitely definitely we knew we knew this was going to be a pivot point um so we're just here to talk about it talk around it um we've already discussed it you and i um the the fact that we are uh, as the title says shelving our compose uh and and so just to go through that i think you and i wanted to uh to talk about some of the things we've done uh what we've learned um where we failed where we succeeded and and just our overall experience with our compose um so jack i don't know uh if you had anywhere to start off i just got a big smorgasbord of things i'd like to at least touch on um but but all in due time i guess okay uh yeah i have a lot of, i have the negative i i, <laughs> I don't want to harp on it too much i know there's a lot of positive in there um the major thoughts i think that sprung to mind uh were uh the fact that we declared ourselves a business, even though we had no paying customers, unfortunately, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that was kind of like my first. Yeah, I wrote some stuff down yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of putting together what I could over the past three years, just kind of summing it up into, uh, you know, I put it in forty-eight lines, and there's a lot of white, sp a, a lot of blank space in there, um, and I think three major themes uh, came up for me at least. Uh, which uh the first one i titled here what's the most important part of every joke the punchline <laughs> or what it's the timing <laughs> so that's the, that's part of the joke there <laughs> um <laughs> that was really so, really bad i love it that was that was amazing uh no i i think you and i discussed this quite a bit and we've just kind of I think this is the third time it's been mentioned now. Mm -hmm. You know, if this were a product, if this were mid two thousands or early twenty tens, I think we'd be in the perfect space for it. Um, you mentioned it Monday when we were talking, but I think it's those infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service are it it's it's bloated. It's it's yeah hard it to is. be ten. It's hard to be ten times better than the next person, which is really what the benchmark is for a startup it's they, yeah th there's the quote out there uh from peter Thiel. it says you have to be 10 times better than the second best to be you know viable and i think for us unfortunately it, I, you look at some of the other services that are already out there cloud run you know host sandstorm even home lab and, os yeah and it's like these things are already really really good so yeah uh, i think it would have taken a lot of work for us to get to we were working on feature parity right yeah. i think it would have taken um moving a mountain to get to 10 times better well um, and and i i tried to do a little bit of outlining what you know 10 times better would look like right look so like, yeah uh there some some things i came up with sometimes i came up with um are are you know a, a a bit of central logging for us you know statistics um both on the instance for people to figure out, you know, how their instance, how they are using their instance, right? Are they using it efficiently? You know, if you're using Canboard, you know, what pages are you hitting? If you're using, you know, Bitwarden, how many devices are you connecting, you know, and how are they getting it? Like having those stats for every single service would be insanely difficult. Um, and, oh, and, yeah. and having those and aggregating them and anonymizing them, sending them back to, to us, Right would be really the only way that we could ethically kind of parse them and say, "Hey, this is this is helpful or this is not." Right? We can right. we can kind of go through that. We could tailor at that point. We could tailor discussions um, around. We see a lot of people not using this feature, or we see people overusing that feature. Um, so that would have been a big thing. Um, SSO, I think, was a pie in the sky idea for us, in yeah. that you know a lot of the applications have some kind of way of doing external auth authentication but 
they don't have one single way. Like, there's no, like, one reverse proxy or LDAP will take care of everything. It's, right. It's right. it's all different ways that different applications have implemented. So that that would just be difficult. And you do see that in in other uh, hosting platforms, right? You, you, you see that difficulty. And... Uh, it's it's overcome in various ways, and, and sometimes not at all. Sometimes it's marked. This is just an exception. We can't handle it, and that's that's never going to work. Um, right, work out super well. Um, another. I think identity and I was going to say just a note on that. Mm-hmm. Identity and access management is something I think we're just going to continue to see. I don't know if it's a. We're going to continue to see improvement. I think the space is still being looked into a lot i know authorization authentication are huge nowadays anymore with Mm -hmm. you know i am rule identity access management is just going to be and you have you have services like jump cloud and okta and and they are specializing in in specifically that authenticating to these SaaS services and figuring out how to best you know tie them all together and it's just a herculean effort uh, to to be able to do that um in addition to that you know, we want to follow best security practices, and by doing that, we right. should have enabled 2FA on a lot of what we did, right? And, right? and we just didn't because that's just another level of things that could go wrong. And that, you know, when, when we go to test something, right, we would love to test it without two, two-factor authentication. It's easy, right? It's, it's a the lot easy easier. way to test yeah. it without, right? Yeah, username, password, test user, test user. I don't have to worry about 2FA, but... You know, when you do put that in there, because it is secure, you are hampering yourself when it comes to any kind of testing. And and we didn't have any kind of automated testing, really. Um, a lot of our upgrade testing was deploy it. Manual. Does it work? Can you put something in it? When you migrate it, is it still there kind of thing? So there was a lot of that going on. Um, and and coming to security, too. Like the, the thing you could do with containers that's really cool is micro segmentation. Right. I mean, that's that's you start talking about the cool things you can do with this kind of architecture. So all the security around the containers, what can come into it, what can go out of it, you know, almost like a, a web application firewall or eBPF or something on the inside there on a, a kernel level or, or just like on a containerized level to be able to do that and 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 figure out those those norms in a machine learning AI type of way, right? Which is, which is the promise of, of 2022, right? To be able to notify you when something goes wrong immediately and not notify you when something didn't go wrong. So like uh, one of the things that drove it home for me is, you know, my, my, uh, my parents have this burger place that they love to go to. And uh one time uh, they they went there, you know, and, and we're driving home and uh, my stepdad got a text that uh, his card had been used at Sephora's um, or Sephora's, whatever that, that makeup beauty shop is. And they were like, hey, this doesn't seem like you. And and he's like, well, no, it it obviously wasn't and, and, and declined that, that transaction um, or at least disputed it or, or did whatever and had to cancel this card and give him a new one, right? But of all the times you use your credit card, right, it, it follows a pattern, you have a system, you know, and if, if you were like an administrative assistant and watching every single one of those transactions come through and you saw that one to Sephora's, you're like, ah, it's kind of weird. Let me let me flag that, see if see if that's something different. And, and sure enough, it was, right? And we didn't, we didn't have any of that right um which which kind of leads back to your beginning of the conversation around timing right and and all these features are great all these features are are cool and all but you know this would have been a great tech in 2003 right and and a sure. lot of what i'm talking about now would have been reaching for the stars at in in, in 2003 um but in 2022, you know, what are the expectations for tech, you know, and, and that's kind of that it fulfills, uh-huh. it fulfills the promise of, you know, hands off management. Um, and, and, and so being able to only be notified when something goes wrong uh, is, is a big promise there, you know, being able to have one pane of glass to view for everything, have a vertical integration um, for everything I do to, to have my information being interconnected with, with all of the other ways I'm interacting with things. 
Um, and and you you and I discuss that vertical integration with like Nextcloud or you know Sweet CRM or something where you could have a vertical that covered your entire business stack. Everything, right? Right. The 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 problem with that is then at that point why even run R Compose, right? Why not just host the service? It's gonna be it's gonna be more efficient. It's gonna be cheaper, right? It's going to be able to scale better, um, and there's a lot more information out there on how to host it securely and how to how to make it easy for you to 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 manage so timing <laughs> sum that up uh yeah timing um i had my other one the 10x one was a big one i think the space mm. it's, it's so hard to 10x another company with the baseline levels that are already out there right now. Well, and And I I think we, yeah, I was going to say, I think we discussed even, you know, there are companies out there that you, they grab, grab the VC money. Um, and then you can have a team work on it for two or three years, just going after it, uh, working, pushing out product, pushing out features, pushing out products. But, um, that's not what we had in, in store for us. mm -hmm. I think, is what I have with that one. You know, and some of the alternatives, uh, I think we had we had called them out, but you know, Cloud Run, Why You Know Host, uh, Flap, Home Lab OS, Sandstorm, Cap Rover, um, and, and in fact, probably what we would do is in the show notes for this, we we put links to them uh, in there as yeah. well, um, because you know these are these are fine projects. Um, not of all of them are all open source. Um, and that was kind of one thing that I wanted for us that I think sets us yeah. apart from this because a lot of what we do is open source. Um, it's still out there. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Yeah. And I, I am continuing to host, you know, the several services that I use this way. It's, it's my type of self-hosting. And instead of a fully, you know, commercialized... Uh, hosting solution, right? This just becomes, hey, these are Andrew's Ansible scripts. Like, this is how he does it. it yeah, it's nice, though. The system is nice, mm-hmm. I will say. Mm-hmm. The environment, the playbooks, the collection. Uh, it took me a while to wrap my head around everything, but once I finally did, I was like, oh, the system, this works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of touched all the different areas that it needed to. Um, you know, and... And what we had up for run deck, I think, was probably the coolest. Um, the the way we we had that kind of be our central hub, you know, our 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 automation front end, right? I was really happy with the yeah. way that that worked. Um, some of our scripts, um, like one of the ones, I was just kind of reviewing everything we have. Uh, I have a a cloud DNS dot pi script that I wrote and I never touched because it worked every single time. It was like, <laughs> like I even forgot sometimes that the script was running because it was like, oh yeah, everything works just it fine. It just worked. It. Yeah, yeah it, there wasn't any breaking API changes similar to uh, DigitalOcean, but yeah. um, it just worked. Yeah, so that was that was fun. Um, Run deck was sweet because it yeah. also was that API too. Yeah. It wasn't, it was our automation front end, but it also was the API for portal and command center to use to spin up instances, create environments, kind of do all the backend work for us. And that's what we were using all the way up until recently with the uh, commands receivable Mm -hmm. on the actual host machine. Mm -hmm. And that commands receivable is, is nice too. It means I can bring stuff. I could bring it in house if I wanted it to. Yeah. Right. I could, I could bring everything in here, I could set up, and, and actually this may be a, a future project of mine, you know, like setting up a, a, a Bastion host, right, uh, out on the internet and, and reverse proxying everything uh, back in. You know, either that um, or, you know, let's start thinking in, in 2022 tech, right, zero tier VPNs, right, like tail scale, you know, stuff that's using WireGuard. And then I just create a flat network for myself uh, over the internet, and have Point access to yeah, have access to whatever yeah. I need. So, 
stuff like that. Uh, the the cool thing about our compose though is is that it was a cloud service. We were running a cloud service and and it was exposed on the internet. You know, we we kind of we kind of braved the wild west there, and that was that was pretty cool. Braved the wild west. Yeah, it was out there. The Rails out the Rails projects are out there. I mean, they're live. I'll tell you what, I've deployed a handful of projects before this one and I will tell you it was difficult. The other projects was it was difficult. Now, I didn't have those containerized to the level that I did mm. these. Mm -hmm. Um, but wow, it was it easy to deploy out a new branch or a new production tag um with what we had well, with the environment we had, basically just updating updating a version then yeah it was updating a version of the environment for uh either rcompose.com or composition enterprises dash rcompose.com and bam it everything was just working fine it wasn't it, i mean it ran as migrations uh it ran all the database migrations you know we weren't doing anything too crazy it was just a single sql backend so ran the migrations and just spun right up and the front end was right there so I was pretty. I was really happy with how those those end up turning out. That was one of the uh, major wins, I would say. Um, and is that more so on like the uh, success for the Rails hosting side for the item potency of the the both. side? I mean, or, yeah. Even even for myself too. I, you know, a lot of people deploy these apps with Heroku, mm -hmm. which basically is set the environment in Heroku, and then it, it does some kind of magic to deploy that Rails version with that code, but. I don't know. I have some gripes with uh, Rails and JavaScript trying to combine. Uh, I think it was, you know, between five and seven. Uh, there was Webpacker in there, which is real pain, real pain, a real pain uh, development wise. So we, ha you know, everything's all in a mono repo for us, so which it worked. I mean, we, I ended up just hacking it together and it worked. Was it the right thing to do? No, I probably should have built JavaScript separately than I built the you know back end but end of the day it was all it, we switched the production switched the image switched the image tag and it was up and going and so i don't know i i haven't really seen many rails apps dockerized just because of the way state is managed but at the end i mean at the end of the day it's all all the states managed in the database so i don't really know why everyone was griping about hosting it in a, in multiple containers so so the the state in the database yes um also state in the environment variables um and i know we had yeah. gone back and forth about that there's one article that i saved that had a really interesting take on that saying no sysadmin in the right mind would have ever considered doing this with any kind of production system before so why are we doing it now and he's like but you have to mount or you have to um you have to get secrets in somewhere here somewhere right right so the the easiest way or well the most secure way that you're going to want to do it is to have them in there temporarily and then wipe them out permanently. And he he proposed a type of solution almost that we do with the bind mount points, right? Where you you mount in a, a temporary volume with the secrets, you know, read the secrets in when you start it up. And then as part of the then, startup, you unmount it so that it's not running with those secrets on disk. How about that? And I was like, that's a yeah. great idea. That is that is a great idea. So so once it fires up, it just pulls them basically. Yeah, exactly. Once it, once uh, once it fires up, secrets are either in memory in data storage, but not on disk. Wow. So, so I was like, you know what? That's that's fair enough. That's a that's a good idea. So, anyways, that was that was a tangent. Um, but I did want to kind of focus a couple more points on Ruby and Rails um, because you had brought those up earlier. So, like you said, um, from five to seven, there was this webpacker. So, can you describe like your your journey through that and and you know coming into five and and leaving at seven and and all the differences between those? It's Sure. So for this pro, well, that's that was for this project. Basically, uh, we came in at five and we left at seven. In four, I developed a couple applications, uh, and honestly, the JavaScript was limited. It was still, it was JavaScript was still kind of new. It wasn't as you know, Re React wasn't really around. It was very much AJAX, like jQuery and AJAX. So it was all right. You can do whatever you want, but you're gonna have to do it all via jQuery. You know, single request, ten line snippets, right? Ten lines fetches that you're making whereas uh 
five kind of came around and it was like, oh, hey, what's all this stuff with Webpacker? React is kind of the new kid on the block. Um, Angular's out there. Vue.js, just a couple libraries that are just starting to pick up steam. And Rails was like, all right, well, we want to be the back end for these front ends. Why don't we just embed in a bunt? Like, I forget what they even call them. It's like, a, I guess it's a compiler mm. for JavaScript to turn, you know, JSX files, uh, which are React, and then like TypeScript files into vanilla JavaScript. So you're handed Webpacker, which is used to manage dependencies and mm-hmm. all kinds of crap within the JavaScript ecosystem. And Rails is just like, hey, you know what? We'll do the back end, all the real stuff. You can, you can manage your database, do all that. Oh, and guess what? We'll manage your JavaScript too. And I was like, oh, this is okay, great. And it sucked because there were so many changes so fast between five and six and now seven that it was, you look back, I look back and I go, what is going on? I still ask myself, what is happening? Mm. Now it looks like was, so five and six included Webpacker by default and because the versions were so different, trying to find support on Stack Overflow, on GitHub issues, you really had to know exactly what versions the person submitting the issue were having and what versions you were having. And sometimes it wasn't pinned. They didn't have that format like some of the other GitHub issues are like, all right, what version are you running of this, 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 and this? Some of those didn't have that. Some of those were like, oh, running Webpacker 5. It's like, well, are you running Rails 5 or 6? And real theoretically, it shouldn't matter, but ran into a lot of issues mm. with that um with six it ended up we ended up luckily just being able to ve- develop and get a stable it was like node was fun we ended up figuring out node figuring out webpacker and figuring out rails and ruby so there are four different environment basically I, I, full-blown environments mm-hmm. uh that we had to kind of manage to get builds working successfully so what I've done is I've kind of pinned those, right? And said, all right, this works for this. We, we're, I'm able to develop doing this. Um, with these versions, it works fine. Now, I always found myself clobbering all, all the assets eventually because something something would just go haywire. But we got it working um, to a state where we could actually you know, deploy those images out, and it was awesome. And then 7, uh, so we got all that. Everything was working fine. Uh, development environment working great. Uh, building containers was working fine. Uh, that was with six. Six kept going, you know, pushing forward. Seven, uh, Rails is taking a step back saying, all right, look, we're not a JavaScript environment. We're not doing job- this JavaScript stuff. We, we're we going to provide basically a couple ways to do this. You can do it. You can do it manually. You can do it however you want. But we're, st- we're taking a step back. And I, I everyone has their own opinion. I think that was... I think that was a good choice that they made because I think they were just trying to do too much mm. with Rails 5 and 6. Mm. So we'll see where it goes from here. Um, might try and spin up a Rails 7 app just to see what what it's like, but I don't know if I'm going to be happy with it now that I've been doing so much React. What do you, what do you see the end state of Portal being? Uh, are, you, are you left in the lurch? Um, do you feel like there was more to do? Do you feel like you got out everything you could or what? There, there are probably a couple more things I want to do, uh, just to wrap it up. Um, a lot of it was cosmetic, which, uh, is fine. It, 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 you know, a lot of it could be fixed cosmetically. Um, as for functionality, there wasn't. There were a couple things I wanted to look at integrating, um, but I think it sounds weird now that we're kind of retiring it. I think I really want to go back and actually look at the do the kind of platform engineering side. Mm. Take take the take split the JavaScript from the Ruby because there's too much of it that's intertwined, and the views are basically all React pages, and so it's like is this a react app or is this a rails app? And it's like, Nope, it's a mix of both. Mm. So I think functionally it's just a mono repo. And I would like to see if I could maybe for my own sake, split it, split it out into two projects, a react app and a um, Ruby, you know, rails app, but uh, just with an API, just as an API. But um, as for functionality, there's nothing there. I don't, I don't think there's, 
much more I'm going to be adding to it. Um, I think I want to speed up those Docker builds, though. I think that'd be the one thing. That'd be that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Because they're twenty, they're twenty yeah. minutes long, which yeah. is just incredibly slow if you're trying to move to production. Yeah, and and that that hinders a lot of testing, you know. And and I'm I'm a big proponent of that. It's like, look, if you're gonna if you're gonna be able to test, if you're gonna set up a test suite, it, yeah, has, it to has to be something. quick. Yeah, right. And I think so. That it's was, like. Mm-hmm. The, the one thing that came to my mind was, well, if we're not making a single change to any of the JavaScript assets, why are we recompiling JavaScript? Yeah. That came up to my mind many times. Because, like, look, I'm pushing up a minor change to, like, a controller or, or a model. Like, this is not affecting the front end. Why do I have to ta- sit here and burn 15 minutes of the 20-minute build building JavaScript assets? Mm-hmm. That came up. Uh, I might also go back and do, now that we have everything there, look at, look at testing. <laughs> I mean, just to... I don't even know if it, the problem is with testing, uh, and this is why I wanted to split up the application. The problem with testing something like this is that the front end's so intertwined with the back end. Mm, mm-hmm. What you, the controller should return so, the same thing every time based on a certain input, right? Now, how that's displayed is a different story because of the way React and the components go. Mm-hmm. But some kind of testing uh, within Ruby and within the JavaScript environment there was, I had libraries that were added for both, but just never ended up implementing any kind of code for it. Testing, testing, uh, applications that work hand in hand with infrastructure is very difficult. Like that's, and, and, and testing infrastructure is difficult. Testing infrastructure as code. Um, I think one of the things that we came to that, that helped a lot was using our different environments um, for Ansible. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, cause I, I think that allowed us to be able to start something up that was completely isolated from any other instance, right? That was yeah. a, it was a brand new environment, brand new everything. Um, now if you're talking about a legacy type system that would be spinning up an entirely new subnet and network stack and firewalls, you know, different security apparatuses, uh, and and then come the VMs, and then the applications on top of them, right? Which is a little bit more difficult, but you still have this concept of this, these modular bits inside of a, a atomic uh, environment, right? And and these atomic environment are versioned environments, um, and these versions envi- versioned environments, right? You can test. Um, on their own, right? You can you can test everything in inside of them, um, but it's it's difficult because you are spinning up everything, and that's kind of where we came to with in our compose instance. You know, it, it, we did get it down to something like thirteen minutes or so, where where we yeah. were able to de- deploy in, in, an instance um, with like two applications on it. Deploy all the applications; it's something else entirely. Um, but that was that was one of my goals is to have something to spin up. I mean, I even have it in my blog somewhere a couple of years ago. You know, I, I kind of envision myself as a as a conductor, and I just kind of press a button, and everything kind of springs to life. And you know, that's that's what we got with this because we 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 did have everything um, either inferred or explicitly passed uh, as as options, um, and and just let the script run with it, and it popped up an entire stack. Right, an entire usable stack, um, and and for us that looked like Docker containers on one VM. Right, I have no qualms about taking that and moving that over to you know an entire multiple VMs yeah. and yeah. yeah 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 a subnet. Sure, there is. Um, oh man, hold on. There is a talk somewhere out there on the internet um, about. Immutable infrastructure is not the answer is one of them. Uh, There is another one out there that talks about the way to modularize uh, components and stuff. And he talks about building infrastructure a lot like applications. But, you know, having your VM thing and then putting your app thing on your VM thing and your VM thing inside of a subnet thing. And then you have a subnet thing inside of a three-tier network structure thing. Yeah. And, And you can just start to envision how these code snippets work. And he was using Terraform uh, as an example code language, but I think it works for anything where you have these modular parts. And, and you know, that's kind of where you were struggling with, 
with separating out JavaScript from from Rails too. It's like this is all too monolithic. It doesn't right. allow me to be agile, and that's ultimately what what you want out of that. So that you know, and and agile isn't just being fast in delivery. It's also being fast in, in catching errors, right? And it's also being fast to just get stuff up and running so you Move. can do yeah, what you right. need to. Yeah. Speaking of being agile, uh, how do you think we did with our planning processes and and work? I thought we did a gr- I thought we did very well. I thought we were on top of that. Mm-hmm. I thought we had to d- hit the ball out of the park, so to speak. Agreed. Uh, how so? I don't know. I think it's uh, all boils back down to Canboard being a visualization tool, mm-hmm. right? It's easy to see what you have in front of you when you have it right in front of you. Mm-hmm. I think lists don't really help you prioritize either. So basically what how I saw it was if you have the three what is it uh work in progress planned uh review I'll call it um mm-hmm. you basically have three columns where you're working on you have stuff out there for the week yeah. that's scoped that's scoped for two weeks with those three obviously you're only going to be working on one task at a time your brain can only do one thing at a time so it usually ends up being whip or review but what whatever and then planned is just kind of like a placeholder like all right when i get this task done i'm able to move to the next one and i think that's just mm. it helps you to it helps me at least to be able to focus right rather than have eight different things in progress it's like oh what what do i pick now what's first i have so many things going on mm-hmm. so i don't know i think that's just a testament to the uh board system but I, I I thought we did a great job. I I also like that we did the planning once a week stand uh, like a stand up basically once a week. I don't know if daily would have helped. I don't I don't think it would have. Daily is yeah that's a different beast. Um I I think what we did is a prioritization meeting. Um, yeah. Or a a what do you call that replenishment meeting. Yeah, uh, where where you take you're like, all right, well, I had two worths worth of of whip to do right in my in my three four columns, and uh, I got seventy five percent of that done. So I'm going to replenish up to the amount that I could think I could do every two weeks. Yeah, and, yeah, and and do that. Um, I also like the flexible nature of it, where stuff could come in that was emergency or incident related, right? And we we didn't necessarily plan for. Um, but we took that into account too. Um, I also just like the accountability, uh, being able to see what you're doing. You're able to see what I'm doing. We're able to kind of s- look at check it, check each other. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was that was good as well. Um, it's a it's a great collaboration tool. I think. Uh, that being said, I also oh, use yeah. it for personal. Oh stuff. yeah, yeah. Like like that's that's the way I plan my life right now. So. Let me know if you find something better. Honestly, that's 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 gonna be the way it goes. I I, I don't see a sys. I, I, who knows, right? Who knows what system's gonna come next? But I think for now, it, it is one of the best systems out there. There's uh there's certainly other board software out there as well. Uh, I think Camboard was probably the most straightforward of them, um, and and easiest to kind of get into the the guts of, um, but. You know, if I'm not called to support something on an enterprise basis, I might branch out to some of this this other board software uh, that is out there and and see what that looks like. So, uh, just just thinking about forward looking stuff. I've got my own different projects. I've got a couple internal things. Uh, I got a Bitcoin thing I'm looking at doing. Yeah. Um, I will probably be hanging out i i I think i had said to you you know i gotta find a place to kind of troll now that i'm not you know just just uh looking at all of this this arkham post stuff um i think i'm gonna become a little bit more active on uh jason's nomad network so my.nomadnetwork.app um i i really love what jason stapleton's trying to do actually so i just went through his it probably wasn't his latest podcast episode, but uh, one of his very recent ones. And uh, he is uh, not pivoting the business, but he's taking a different tact because he's like, I'm having a mid-career crisis. He's like, I feel like, you know, when I came, putting words in his mouth, but, you know, when I came into the trading space, 
um, there was a lot of shills and stuff. And I think I, I gave good advice, right? I tried to be, you know, separate myself that way. Uh, and then I came into the information sales uh, space. So like, you know, selling, selling how to do this, how to do that, how to do the other thing. He's like, that has just become so saturated and I'm not standing out. I'm not doing anything different, right? I'm creating content, selling that content, creating brand awareness, you know, gaining trust, um, asking for, you know, compensation and then repeating that cycle. He's like, I actually want to do something different. So from what I heard, um, instead of people on the, the network app that is or are at whatever paid tier he he had he's like i'm just going to eliminate that paid tier um as long as you're on it you get access to all my courses all my everything all my interviews everything i put out he's like and 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 he's his goal is to have people start something that nets them a thousand dollars a month Right. He's like, if I can get yeah. everyone a thousand dollars a month, that's twelve thousand dollars a year. How much different is your life going to be if you have an extra twelve thousand dollars? And it's something yeah. stupid like 70 percent of Americans don't have a thousand dollars in their bank account saved up like it's so. So what I see him doing is, is very noble. Um, he's really taking a risk here. So I want to see how that pays off. Um, and and also, I, I think addressing our initial failure right of of not actually being a business being a business in name only yeah um yeah. that would be a great place to start off doing a legitimate like side hustle rather than creating a product to, i yeah go ahead yeah go to ahead, finish to the try thought. to i have a to comment try to, on it yeah yeah to, to creating a product to try to transition into it as a full-blown uh job rather than just trying to help people on the side. And I've been thinking about this, you know, it, it, were we really able to help anyone, right? Was anything we offered able to help everyone? I'm, I'm sure we have uh, a little bit. I, I think I, we helped ourselves quite a bit. We absolutely I helped agree. ourselves. I agree. Um, I, I, I've, I've loved <laughs> I took away this. A lot. Yeah. I took away a lot. <laughs> I took a lot away from the podcast and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit here. But, you know, realistically, starting from, from, from a little side something, Right. And and proving that out with tangible dollars and cents and saying, hey, this is somewhere that I am helping someone. And I know that I'm helping them because they've given me money to do that. You are delivering value. Yeah, I'm delivering value. value. Right. Yeah. Delivering value. Yeah. To answer it kind of bluntly. No, we never ever monetized from the beginning, focusing on paying customers. But I said, uh, I guess looking back, we were results driven towards our own results instead of our customers results we i we did what we wanted we, there's no doubt about that that's true um did it deliver anything for anyone besides us i mean i absolutely think it could have um i, I just it, again it, it goes down to that 10x better than the next guy right well and um, and all these it, the thing is the applications delivered value Right. Right. It wasn't right. anything that our compose brought to the table that was novel that really right. upped it. It was a platform. It was a platform as a service. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that that platform did, I mean, at the bare minimum, what it needed to do. It it, it really it deployed all the applications. It, 13 exactly, minutes. It, exactly. It, it, all the applicate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, it, it did no more than that. Um, and I think I think that's very hard to demonstrate uh to to end users or consumers um where that value really is right, right. why it's valuable to have something be item potent versus not right why right. it's why it's important you know even if we had gone into the environment variables versus temporary secrets mount thing that would have been completely lost on somebody right, right. so actually delivering value is always going to be more important than being secure or being technically correct on the back end. Yeah, it's going to sure, help you right. scale. They don't. It's it's going to help you survive, right? But if you never get off the ground in the first place, of what use of that is to, you know, what, what use right. is that to you? And I even had a note here. It's what is the one thing? Do things, uh, I forget who says this one. It might be Peter Thiel again. Do things that don't scale. Or maybe mm -hmm. Eric Reese says that. But... 
I, I think we went out and quite literally did the the uh, the exact opposite, right? We went out and built something that could scale. We could it, it scale this infinitely. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And I mean, fine. You we might not be able to handle enterprise customers, but I think pretty easily we'd be able to just say, all right, we're going to deploy this on a subnet. We're going to deploy VMs, and we're going to deploy apps on the VMs. Like, mm-hmm. I think we easily could have scaled that as well. So, that's my one other uh, note that I had on being kind of results driven. I think we're results driven towards our own results is what it ended up being. And and it's funny you, you reference these things in, in conversation, but you know, we've gone through a lot of information our, ourselves, right? You know, we've, we've oh read my gosh, stuff. 40 podcast episodes. Yeah. We talked about a book on almost every single one, the amount of information just, mm-hmm hold from all that it's been valuable yeah the podcast has been pretty awesome if you asked me i think i hope everyone enjoyed it yeah that was that was my single greatest takeaway is that we even despite not being a content oh um, you would factory, you would have thought we were <laughs> you would have thought we were <laughs> you know just the, the the various things we tried you know the the little i i think the the very first thing besides the podcast were the the promo snippets Right, the the minute long things. Um, yeah, we tried uh, some infographics here and there. Not really infographics, more like like. Oh, headlines. you wish they were. Inf- you wish I, they were infographics. I would love some some slick ass infographics, man. Those those. Mm, 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 mm. Um, and then you know, then we transitioned to video. Uh, I started doing my integration sessions, um, and we we cut it up into digestible parts. Um, you know we we have just ran through so many things, you know, even on the back end, like video editing and audio editing that I just had no clue on how to do prior to this. Immensely valuable, especially with the, uh, audacity, the, the process that you kind of had and created for fine tuning the podcast. I mean, the quality is just incredible. I say the quality is incredible, but honestly it is. I, I mean, it's a lot better than just, all right, well, Spacebar and ship ship it out. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, we we actually spent time making sure it it met the bar that we set for it. Right? Yeah, and I think yeah. I think that bar was pretty high because both you and I do like to listen to, to podcasts and, and stuff that's well produced, and and I think this comes out very very well at at the end of that process. Um, and and I've I've very much enjoyed going through this podcast. I think. Um, it's 42 episodes. That's yeah. 45. What well, that 45. I don't know why I get stuck on 45, uh, 42, but 45 episodes. Uh, what is it? Tw- some, most people don't make it to 10, like uh, eight or 10. Yeah. Per- yeah. 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 Fif- something like 50% of podcasts don't make it to 10 episodes and then something like 99 don't make it to 25 or I don't know, something like that. Yeah. But here we are at 45 and that we did one every other week. Mm-hmm. So just over oh, re, re, butting right up against uh two years there yeah yeah just about two years a, a, a couple short um and i'm not sure what exactly prompted me to end this you know i was kind of racked by i wouldn't say necessarily uh anxiety but i was anxious right um, I wouldn't say nervous, but I was nervous, right? Um, and, and I saw a lot of opportunity around me, and I was trying to figure out, you know... What's the best thing? Yeah. What's what, the best path forward? What's best next, right? And, yeah, right. And uh, I, I, for the first two years, I kept choosing Arcompose. Like, the choice that I made was to forsake everything else for Arcompose. Yeah. And, and, and that was the, the choice that I think was the right choice at that time. Um, I, I like usual, you know, kept, kept making myself make that decision and, and, and making that choice to, to ask myself, is this something you still want to continue with? And it, it became a resounding no for, for many different reasons, you know, and the whole, you know, this is tech from 2003 and, you know, um, you know, are we really helping anyone? All those conversations are it's things hard. that it's yeah, hard conversations. They're very hard, and the, and it's even hard to talk to other people about them too, because uh, yeah, even 
yes, being in my own world uh, did make it more difficult. You know, you and I are just kind of off doing our own thing. Um, but LARPing. You know, LARPing. Yeah. I mean, and, and what, you described it that at one point, I think, uh, shoot, almost a year ago, I think. Um, but that one kind of, that, that one kind of stuck with me there. Yeah. Because it, it, that's what it felt like. Cause we were making stuff for ourselves and in our own little world, in our own little way, we were, you know, playing around with our compose. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that is almost, you know, one-to-one yeah. definition of, of LARPing. Right. And, you know, some people I told that to got it. Some people I told it to didn't, you know, other things resonated with them. But I, I, I kept kind of pitching these arguments for and against to to a lot of people. And, and I am fortunate enough to have a large support network of, of people who love me and care about me where I can bring my problems to them. Um, and, and that helped a lot to kind of try to figure out where I was. Uh, and and where I thought the the project was heading, and you know, it really, if something like this was worth it, um, you know, and it's it's weird that this kind of morphed into the problem of all right, well, the the text there, it's the you know, it's a marketing and sales that's the problem. Then I had to figure out, you know, why is the marketing and the sales the problem? And it's like, well, it's not not even the marketing, right? Um, because you're not. You know what you need to do to market. It's go out right. and talk to people. Right. I still don't have your or well your video cut out again. Um. um I'm just gonna keep going though. Um. You know the the marketing is like, look, I gotta get this in front of people. So like, if people aren't gonna be able to find you in a in a Google search, you gotta get it in front of them. Um. And and the the minute I started to get it in front of people, it was relatively unimpressive, right? Which is really a good thing for a platform because it's 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 not the main thing, right? The the sure. apps are the main thing. Sure. Um, but that started to lead me to question, you know, how are we different from a well, shop it- that you know hosts, develops on, develops on, and. Uh, customizes a sweet CRM for individual customers, right? right. Um, how are we different than, you know, a super scalable Nextcloud integration, right? Or or a super cheap one, and and we we were just in this this market niche which straddled a couple, and and that's never good. I think one of the the things you brought up, Jack, is you know, specialize somehow, right? And and really hit that hit that niche market it, it dive dig down and, and and really zero in on where your custom audience is you know what who are the people that you're going to be serving and and for us it was just small businesses and that was just too broad they're everywhere right mm-hmm. what is it 70 percent of organizations are small or medium sized mm-hmm. of one i think it's like 70 percent or one person and then the next 30, 20, 20 after that are two or more. I, I don't know. I don't know the number, but I think 70% are one person. Mm-hmm. And that's something I've been thinking about too. The the content that can you, you actually share. So we can see if we can get um, I actually like where we landed on. I, I think I might've gone back to the promos. Um, if I put like a, uh, if I put like some kind of closed captioning on them, you know, a lot of people like that, uh, just having like a video autoplay just with closed captioning because like reading the, it, the, the amount of times that you're going to have someone listen to your audio is very, 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 very small. Right. Um, that's as well why I like, you know, infographics because it's, it's the best way to get across a lot of information in a, in a life changing way. Dense. Yeah. yeah. It's dense. Yeah. And it's, it's impactful too. Um, I also think, you know, blog posts we underutilized um, and, and you're actually really good at that. I was super impressed with uh, the blog posts that you put together and, and you plan on doing more of that if I, if I heard right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, I have uh I'm going to step back from code, I think, and do an evaluation mm. of what I want to do, what I want to do next. Mm. Uh, I know I had some uh, other plans for Ruby Rails, that stuff, uh, which I think is definitely going to be in the works. But project wise, uh, we'll see where I where I where I end up right now or for 
over the next couple months here. My my video still there? Yeah, yeah, no, you're good. Oh, okay, good. yeah. I didn't know you're looking 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 at the uh, <laughs> camera. Yeah. I didn't know if I was there. There's an issue. <laughs> no, you're good. Yeah, so um, I like writing. I don't know what it is about it. Uh, I, I definitely think I'm a better writer than I am a speaker. So this, I think the podcast has helped with that. Just rearranging my thoughts into a proper way. But I definitely find it easier to just. It's a lot easier to re-edit words on a page than it is uh, splicing together cuts of a podcast. I can tell you that firsthand. That's very true. Just even with audio, even with audio. Yep. But we'll see what we'll see where I go from here. Um, we'll see where we both go from here. I'm excited to see what you have uh, going on in the future here. Yeah, I I, I think I'm going to be diving back into the uh, the Bitcoin sphere. Which is always fraught with peril. You know, you're, you're liable to get your head chopped off for absolutely nothing. But Oh, man. <laughs> I figure why not? Why not? I'm actually probably going to... I'm Because uh, I've got something in the works right now that I've, I've started to tinker with. I've, I've whiteboarded everything out that you can't see. But, you know, everything's, everything's kind of laid out here. Um, so I might do something stupid like releasing early and often. Right and saying, "Here's my proof of concept," which is hey, completely, check this out. Yeah, completely yeah. not working. But I want to see. I want to see you. Re- I want to see you release the uh, just a landing page, no code, no, no proof co- of concept. Just some, maybe like a like a abstract on a white paper. That and would that's be, it, yeah. and that's it. Oh, and that's white it. papers <laughs> must. White paper abstract. A must. Yeah. If you're you're not a Bitcoin site, you're not you're not <laughs> running a Bitcoin project if you don't have a white paper. <laughs> We used to call those readmes, but no, we can't use that anymore. It has to be a white paper. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm going to do that. Um, I'm probably going to be looking for some other kind of position for my day job. Um, I know I really, I really was able to flex my muscles when it came to uh, automation, repeatability, uh, modularity, um, and 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 just the way that atomic structures are able to bring a lot more predictability to, to everything that I'm doing. Right. And, and, and make it a lot easier for me to, to figure out what's going wrong or to reproduce errors or or stuff like that. So looking at some kind of a SRE role, um, or like a platform operations role, something like that, where, where I can design large scale automation, pipes for for other people to use like and 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 i've done that to an extent um where i'm at right now uh but i just i i I think i'm underutilized in my current capacity and would love to branch out into a different job role one that doesn't necessarily exist where i'm at so um and and that is a mentality shift right and and i'm looking for someone with a 2022 mentality right i'm I'm looking for companies that are, um, I, I heard it put this way, that are product-led instead of project-led, right? So rather than having um, SME teams, right, you have full-stack teams, and those full-stack t- teams are responsible end-to-end for a, a given product. And that that works very well with, you know, the modern micro-architecture, you know, services where, where you have what amounts to our API will be like this for a specific version and will never change, you know. Our internals may, you don't need to care about that. All you guys need to care about is, is the API, so... You know, I, I think that's really how cool things work going forward, and and I want to to kind of narrow in on that. I, I think I'm always going to be drawn more to the infrastructure side of things, just how I'm wired. Um, I, I I love that. I th- I actually think it's even more of a challenge than applications because applications you have so many developers out there and so many different already explored possibilities that you have pretty much a set standard of best practices on how to do things infrastructure is still the wild west you know you 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 kind of got the idea of a three-tiered architecture but then what you know like how do you set up a network for a lot of different things how do you you know there's not a whole lot of standard standardization uh around that so it's it's still something where you, people can make a really big difference in. I'd, I'd like to make my mark there if i can so we'll see we'll see how that goes the plumbing right it's the plumbing yep yep and you know 
people don't get elected because of plumbing. I, I, I heard it this way. You know, I was, I was talking with, uh, with my family and they're like, yeah, there was a, there was a mayor and he's like, you know, replace, replace it, you know, a, 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 a thousand miles of, of sewage and nobody bats an eye, but you know, paint a few park benches and you get reelected, you know, and it's like it, 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 <laughs> as someone firsthand getting their, uh, street redone for plumbing uh, i can tell you i don't appreciate it because they are let they're forcing us to park around the block it's yeah. a nightmare yeah exactly exactly it's it's always a nightmare and if i can lessen that nightmares yeah, hellscape then yeah i i'm i'm more than happy to to do that i i i'd, I'd like to be faced with that challenge so we'll see how that goes awesome i i know we'll be in touch i know uh that for sure i know i'm coming up soon yeah but. yeah absolutely we're we're gonna hang we're gonna we're gonna kick it and uh and kind of enjoy ourselves relax probably go to uh old bag of nails um oh yeah why not um if if anyone ever wants to meet me and and is willing to offer free dinner at, at old bag of nails i will absolutely take them up on that no questions asked so that's a that's an easy way to get my attention um what about you jack what's a what's a good way to get your attention that's gonna be a good one. That's a great question. Uh, mm. I, I'm down here. I, you know what? I'm down here. Uh, mm. So, I, I love myself a burger. I'll tell you that. Okay. Uh, right up the street, but I, I, I will still be available online. Oh, uh, I, I, mm. I don't think we're gonna get rid of the uh, chat room and matrix in Element. Um, that'll be around. So. Yep, we'll that'll be, be around. Um, the site and the podcast episodes will remain up. Uh, the back end may not remain the same. Um, you know, I may transition to something that's static more so because because we're not we're not changing stuff. We don't need to host actual VMs. Um, but that's a that's a project for future Andrew. Yeah, you know, sucks for that guy. So he'll he'll take care of that. <laughs> that's future Andrew's problem. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> but I'll tell you what. Um, I know we mentioned it earlier. All the projects are MIT licensed, so they are. If if you have an issue, uh, feel free to open an issue on the GitLab page. I, I know it con, I know it contacts us, uh, so we will be alerted if you open an issue. Um, if you say why is this stale, uh, we might direct you right to this podcast. But nonetheless, uh, we'll still be getting alerts on all of those projects. And, uh, yeah, everyone, you know, who reached out, uh, we appreciate you. Uh, everyone who uh, made this possible, you know, personal support or, you know, not, not so much public support, but, but a lot of personal support uh, went into to making this possible. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to everyone listening who knows that that is them. So thank you for that. I think that about wraps it up here. Right at the hour mark, too. I'll tell you what, we're a lot shorter now than we were uh, first episode. I think that first episode ran well into two and a half. Regular old GRC episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely uh, definitely not a ride in the car. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad we put out this last episode. Um, and I... I, I really do um, think that there is a bright future for all the tech that's coming. Also a dark future, don't get me wrong. But like, uh, I, I, I would, I am excited to see what 2022, 2023, 24, 25, what that holds uh, and, and where people go from there. But from us, uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. We hope Thank you enjoyed you. our Compose. Yeah, I was going to say, we hope you enjoyed our Compose cast as yeah. a whole. Thank you. Be safe. And we'll see you all in real life. Bye, everybody. <laughs>